class 12, which is sections 2.1 and 2.2 in your textbook. So we're moving into chapter 2. Um, we have learned what a function is, right? We talked about um, functions and function notation on Wednesday, so one week ago. And, um, oh, there was that sheet that I asked you to do for Monday. You can hand that in before you leave. Um, and so today we're going to first talk about the domain and range of a function's graph. So we talked about the domain and range of a function last class. And the domain was the set of all inputs or x values, and the range was the set of all outputs or y values. Do you remember this? I'll give you a little refresher. <clears throat> so for example, if I have a set of points, is that set of points a function? Yes, uh, there are no x values that give two different y values, right? So this is a function. What's its domain? Zero, two, and three. Just the x coordinates of the list of points. And what's its range? One, four, and seven. Does that make sense? Domain and range of a function. The domain is just the x coordinates and the range is the y coordinates. So I could look at those three points, instead of writing them like that, I could plot them in a plane. And the answers would be the same. It would still be a function. The domain would still be 0, 2, and 3, and the range would be 1, 4, and 7. But most of the graphs that we look at aren't going to be discrete like that, right? If I plot these points, I get three discrete, 2, 4, 3, 7, I get three distinct points. I'm not going to connect them with the line because it's just those three points. Okay, so but most graphs that we look at in this class when we deal with functions are going to be continuous, infinite kinds of things. So here's the graph of a function y equals f of x. Remember, domain is the set of all inputs or x values, and the range is the set of all outputs or y values. So your domain is the set of all x values that a graph lives on. So if this is my whole graph, it starts here and ends here, then this set of x values is the domain of the graph. All the x values that uh, give a y value. And then this set of values is going to be your range, all of the y values produced by the graph. <coughs> <clears throat> so let's take a look at this function here. It ends at negative 7, 6. That's an end point, but it goes on forever on the right. So it ends on the left, but continues on on the right. And I want to come up with its domain and its range. So its domain is the set of x values that the graph lives on. So what's the furthest x value to the left for this graph? negative 7. So that's where I'm going to start my domain. And I'm going to use a square bracket because it's a closed dot on the negative 7. Yeah. Yeah, and then it covers every x value starting at negative 7. Every, the graph lives on every single x value. So this just goes all the way out to infinity. So you look at the end point and you say, okay, all of these x values my graph lives on. So that's my domain. All right, if I want to look at the range, I'm going to look at y values. What's the lowest y value my graph lives on? Negative 2. Yeah, so we're just looking at the y values for the range. So this would be negative 2. Include it because it actually does hit that point. And then what? It go, and then it hits every y value as I move up. My graph lives on all of these y values. And because this keeps going up and up forever, it goes to infinity. OK? 
Kind of makes sense? All right, let's do one more together, and then I'll have you two, you guys do the next two. All right, so for this graph, what is its lowest x value? Negative 5. So its domain starts at negative 5. We include it because that's a closed dot. Okay. And the biggest x value? 3. The furthest um, right that the graph goes is 3, 1, and we're just looking at x values for domain 3. And then for range, what's the smallest y value that this graph lives on? 0. Yep, this is the lowest. 0. And then the biggest y value? 4. And it hits every y value in between. So 0 to 4. You got it. All right, so take a minute or two in your groups and try to write down the domain and range of the next two graphs. All right, graph in the middle. I want to look at its domain first. Domain is x values. What x values does the graph live on? What interval of x values does it live on? Negative 4 to... Negative 4 to 0. We're not including the negative 4 because it's an open circle there. We are going to include the five, uh, sorry, that should be a 5, 5 because we're using the x coordinate and include that one. And then for the range, smallest y value, negative 5, should we include it? Nope, because it is an open circle. And then the biggest y value, 5. I know. <laughs> Round. How, how do I decide to use a parenthesis or a square bracket? So when the circle is not filled in, that means that that means that that point is not included on the graph. So my x values are getting really close to negative four, but they never actually get there. So the round bracket means. Negative 4 is the end point, but it's not included. Yeah. When you do include it is when, um, when you use a square bracket is when the dot is filled in. OK, and then the third graph. Smallest x value, negative 4. And biggest x value, infinity, because this, this line looks like it keeps heading to the right forever. and I'm going to not I'm going to include the negative 4 because it's a closed dot. You never include infinities, you always put parentheses on them. And then my range, what's the smallest y value? Ooh, be careful. Negative infinity. This keeps going down forever, so there are y values smaller than the negative 4. So it's a little tricky. So it keeps going down forever, so my smallest y value, I'm going to put as negative infinity. And then what's my biggest y value? <coughs> Zero. Happens twice. And should I include it? Yes. Because it's closed dots there. Good. So that's how you find domain and range for a graph. So. Here's a graph of a, a function, y equals f of x. What is f of 0? So this is the function notation we learned last class, right before the test on Wednesday, so you might not remember all of it. right? Whatever is in parentheses, we had, give you a little reminder, this is function notation, right? where x these are x values, inputs. And f of x is an output or a y value. So when I write f of 0 means the y value when x is 0. 
Okay, so whatever's in parentheses is your x value, and f of that thing is the corresponding y value. <coughs> so if we go back to our picture, zero's in parentheses, that means it's an x value. So f of zero is asking for the y value that corresponds to x equals zero. So what is the y value in my graph that corresponds to an x value of zero? Three. Good. So we find the x value of zero, we go up to the graph, and we say, oh, that y value is three. So f of zero is three. Now, what x values have corresponding y values that are zero? Negative two and negative three. Good. And then I might write because f of negative 3 equals 0 and f of 2 equals 0. It wouldn't be necessary to put that on a quiz or anything, just if you have it in your notes so you can figure out why you got those answers. Yeah, negative 3 and 2. So negative 3 and 2 are special points for a function. We've been calling them x-intercepts right, places where the graph crosses the x-axis. They're also sometimes called the zeros of the function because they are the values that make the function equal to zero. So sometimes we call them zeros for short. We've been calling them x-intercepts up until now. Um, we might start using those words interchangeably, real zeros and x-intercepts. Okay, so by the definition of a function, right, that said every x value can have only one y value, how many x-intercepts can we have? As many as we want. We could have infinite x-intercepts, in fact. If I drew the graph... Is that a function, what I just drew there? It is, because it passes the horizontal line test, and it has infinite x-intercepts. It touches the x-axis infinitely many places. It lives on the x-axis, yeah. Good. So we can have lots of x-intercepts. How many y-intercepts can you have if you have to be a function? <coughs> Close. You can have, yeah, that's not, not none. More than none. Let me draw a picture. So if I give um, a y-intercept to some function, Can I give, can I put another y-intercept later? Why not? Now it fails the vertical line test. Yeah. So a function can only have one y-intercept. If you had more than one, all of a sudden when we draw a vertical line here, it's two points, not a function. So a function can only have one y-intercept. <clears throat> it can have zero, right? It's possible that it doesn't ever cross the y-axis. <clears throat> have at most one value for x equals zero. All right, so we often talk about where functions are increasing, decreasing, and constant. And when we put graphs in context of some kind of meaning, Increasing, decreasing, and constant makes a lot more sense. So the first time we talk about this, we're going to talk about um, time, temperature, flu scenario, right? So this is hours after 8 a.m. and a person's temperature who has the flu. All right, so over what open interval? So an open interval means you don't include the endpoints. You use parentheses. Is your temperature decreasing? Eight to eleven. 
Yeah, because zero is representing 8 a.m., right? And three hours after 8 a.m. is 11, so my temperature was going down. It started at 101, and it ends up at 98.6. So decreasing temperature from what open interval? We'll use x values 0 to 3, which is 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. The temperature, f of x, falls as x time increases on that interval. And over what open interval is your temperature increasing? 3 to 5. Yeah. So it hits a low point, and then it starts going back up. And from 3 to 5, it's increasing. So notice I'm only describing the increasing and decreasing intervals by giving times. Right? I don't care what the actual temperature was. You know, I decreased from 101 to 98.6. Don't care. They only asked me when, right? On what interval of time was my temperature decreasing or increasing? So that's all I answer. It's just an interval with the input value and the independent variable. All right, over what open interval is my temperature staying the same? Is it constant? Five to seven. Good. And then at what temperature, at what time is my temperature the lowest? <coughs> right, yeah, the x equals 3 or 11 a.m., yeah. So again, they didn't ask me what my lowest temperature was, just when that happened, 11 a.m. So this is how we answer increasing, decreasing, constant, lowest, highest questions in general with just x values talking about where. So this illustrates the ideas of when a graph is increasing, decreasing, and constant. They're fairly intuitive. Here's a more precise definition of increasing, decreasing, constant. So f is increasing if f of x1 is less than f of x2 whenever x1 is less than x2. So here's an x1, here's an x2, right? x1 is smaller than x2, and f of x1, which is the y value, is smaller than f of x2, the other y value. So from here to here, function's increasing. Visually, you don't really have to think about that. You can just look at it, and if it's rising from left to right, the function is increasing. If the function is falling from left to right, like from here onwards, we say that's decreasing. And then if the function is flat, it's constant. And then we can talk about relative maxima and minima. That's when I said, when is the temperature the lowest? That would be a relative minimum. So when a function changes from increasing to decreasing, at some point c comma f of c, we say we have a relative maximum at c, right? So look at this picture. My function goes from increasing, going up, going up, going up, going up, increasing, and then it hits a high point, and then it's decreasing, going down, going down, going down, going down. So when you switch from increasing to decreasing, this point is called a relative maximum, and this point here is at c comma f of c, the y value would be f of c, and we say it has a maximum at x equals c. So whenever you're asked where, you just give an x coordinate. An x coordinate's like a dress, an address, and the y coordinate is like what lives there. The maximum value is f of c. So c is where the, val where the maximum lives, f of c is the maximum value. And then, alternatively, similarly, we have a relative min, decreasing to increasing, decreasing to increasing. That point where you switch is called a relative minimum. And again, the language is really a little bit picky. You give the address about to say where the minimum occurs, you say it occurs at x equals c. It occurs at the x value, and the minimum value is the y coordinate. <clears throat> so, for example, 
um, I want you to work in your groups, sort of pulling all the stuff we just talked about together uh, for this particular graph. This together. What is the domain of this function? Yes. Close it. Very good. Yeah. Good. Perfect. Smallest x value to the biggest x value. And then the range, smallest y value, negative 2, biggest y value, infinity. See that part on the right just keeps going up. All right, the zeros of f, right? These are x-intercepts. So the zeros are the x-intercepts, and where do they happen? Yeah, like negative 5.8 approximately, negative 1.2, and where else? 5, yeah, that also touches the x-axis at 5. So those three numbers are called the zeros of f. So you can just list them like that, or you could write x equals those three numbers. Either one would be correct. So those three numbers are the zeros, the places where the function equals zero. Oh, uh, yeah, one, two, three, four, yep, 4.8. Thank you. No, not in this not in this circumstance. You're I'm forcing you to estimate here. Yeah. All right, what is f of 0 approximately? 2.5 or may, maybe 2.6 or 2.7. Again, it's an estimate. f of 0 is the y coordinate when x is 0, right? So when x is 0, I find the y coordinate about 2.5 or 2.6. <clears throat> All right, intervals where f is increasing. All right, give me one interval where f is increasing. Close. Increasing. Negative 3 to 2. So when you give intervals where a graph is increasing or decreasing, you only give x coordinates. So I, it's increasing right here, right, from this point to this point. But you only give x-coordinates as address as the interval for where it's increasing. So you say negative 3 to 2. So negative 3 comma 2. And when I'm doing increasing and decreasing, I always put open brackets because that point, that single point at negative 3 and at 2, it's not really increasing or decreasing there. That's the point where it's changing. Right, so this is kind of a like textbook to textbook convention thing. Like some books will tell you to put square brackets, and some books will tell you to put open brackets. Our book uses open brackets, and to me, I think it makes a little more sense because it's not both increasing and decreasing, but but neither. Does that make sense? <clears throat> this point at negative 3, negative 2 is the point where you switch from decreasing to increasing. So it's not really either one. So you don't include the endpoints. All right, what's my other interval where f is increasing? <coughs> 5 to infinity. Good. So those are my two intervals where f is increasing. And the way you put two intervals together or two sets together is to union them. So you put a big union symbol in between. All right, and then the intervals where f is decreasing. Let's see, negative 7 to negative 3. Perfect. From x equals negative 7 to x equals negative 3, the graph is decreasing. So negative 7 comma negative 3, and we don't include either one because those endpoints are really in between points where it switches from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. And then what should I, what's my other place where it's decreasing? 
2 to 5. Yeah, you give the x coordinates 2 to 5. It's also what? Yes, also x coordinates. So increasing, decreasing, and constant, you always just give x coordinates. All right, so now I'm looking for x values that make f of x less than or equal to 0. So that is x values where the y value is less than or equal to 0. So what x values in my graph give negative y values? Yeah. <laughs> you got it. Negative 4.8 to negative 1.2. From here to here, the y coordinates are all below the x axis. That means that they're negative, right? So from negative 4.8 to negative 1.2, these are the x values that give negative y values. So negative 4.8 to negative 1.2. Should I include the endpoints? Yes, because the question asked me y coordinates less than or equal to 0, right? And at those points, the y coordinates are equal to 0. So I'm going to include them. So sometimes you have to read the question carefully to decide about the endpoints. OK, relative maxima. Where do I have a relative maximum? What's the address? 2. The address of my relative maximum is x equals 2. What is the value of my relative maximum? 5. There you go. So it lives at x equals 2, and it is 5. So my maximum lives at x equals 2, and it is 5. So my relative maxima is 5, and it occurs at 2. Five and zero. Which one are you thinking? This one? Oh, that's a minimum. That's a relative minimum. So yeah, I was looking at the relative maximum. So the negative 7, 6 is an interesting one. Some textbooks will tell you that it is. Some textbooks will tell you that it isn't. It depends on how, yeah, it depends on how you define a relative maximum. So if you remember, when we said what a maximum was, it was a place where the graph switches from increasing to decreasing. Right. So we said it's a place where it switches from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. And that point at negative 7 did nothing before the negative 7. So there's no switch. So we don't include that as a relative maximum for our textbook. Some books would, would say it is. But by the way we defined it, it's not. <clears throat> so do I have any relative minimums? I have two of them. What are their addresses? Mm, negative 3 and 5. Their addresses are negative 3 and 5. Their values are negative 2 and 0. Okay. So we would say relative minima occurs at, so I'm going to do those first. So they occur at, I can't remember now negative 3 and 5, those are the x values. And the relative minima are, right, the relative minima are negative 2 and 0. So we have m minimum values of negative 2 and 0. They occur at negative 3 and 5. So maximum is 5, this is a y value, and it occurs at an x value. Occurs at an x value. Y value. All right, give me a value for x that has an f of x value of 6. Negative 7, good. There might be another one over here. Maybe maybe eight. Uh, that's, that's a guess, right? Because that goes on forever, so it's gonna hit six again. <coughs> Definitely negative seven. 
um, negative 7, and approximately 8. Those are the x values. That would give you 6. All right, let's take a look at f of 3. That means x coordinate of 3 corresponding y coordinate. Is the corresponding y coordinate positive or negative? Positive, because it's above the x axis. All right, does that make sense? Feeling like starting to sink in? All right. So the last thing we're going to talk about is even and odd functions. And there's a little animation um, in my math lab that I want to show you. But I also want to take the time to show you all the cool stuff there is in my math lab, since I'm going to go in there anyway. So if you go to um, Multimedia Library, that's where I'm going to go now. You can choose any chapter that you're working on. We're working on Chapter 2 right now. And it's in Section 2.2, the thing I'm looking for. But let's look at all sections, just so we can see all the cool stuff. There, <clears throat> They often have interactive figures, video lectures, so like the author of the textbook giving a lecture on the section. So that's an alternative to the lecture that you get in class. You can watch another one. <coughs> There's great animations. Um, the multimedia textbook is where you can just go to read your textbook. There are videos, chapter test prep videos, PowerPoint presentations. So I'm going to look at um, interactive figures and animations. It's one of those. I can't remember. I think it's interactive figures. I want symmetry of functions, even and odd. <coughs> okay, so this is the figure that you have in your in your notes, right? So what I'm going to do is uh, play around with that figure, and you're going to look at the x values and write down the y value for each one. So there really should be two columns here output value for each of these x's. In this case, like you can see at negative 2.5 and at 2.5, the y values are both negative, 14.44. So where did that go? There we go. I wonder if I can make this bigger. I don't think so. So as I slide x, uh, show symmetry. Show coordinates. There we go. Okay, now I should be able to grab it. There we go. As I slide the x's, what do you notice about the y values? They're always the same. For a, a positive x and a negative x, no matter what x value I choose, right, as I just move these guys around, for a positive x and a negative x, the y values are always the same. So that's, we, that's a special kind of function that we call even. Why do we call it even? Good question. We'll talk about it another time. <laughs> but it's just a special kind of function where when you have a positive x and a negative x, you get the same y. It's called an even function. And the way you can spot an even function is, is, is if it has y-axis symmetry, right? So for, a posit for an x over here and an x over here, you have the same y. That means that it has to have y-axis symmetry. So let's see that. Here's another even function. It's got y-axis symmetry. As I move my x's around, the y's are always the same. Here's another one. y-axis symmetry for a positive x and a negative x, you always have the same y value. Uh, uh, yeah, this one is not even. Yeah, but it does have a, 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 a relationship, right? This is not even because for a positive x and a negative x, the y's aren't the same, but those y's are definitely related. Yeah, one of them, for 1.22, the y value is 5.28.
And for the opposite x, negative 1.22, you get the opposite y, negative 5.28. And you just keep getting that. You know, for, for two opposite x's, you get opposite y's, 15.89 and negative 15.89. This is a special kind of function that we call odd. Why do we call it odd? I don't know. I do know. I'm not going to tell you right now. <laughs> it's, not, it's not that hard. I'll explain it after. So this is a special kind of function called odd. Is this guy odd? Yep. So as I move the x's, I keep getting opposite y's. Yeah. And it has a special kind of symmetry called origin symmetry. So if I were to fold this graph twice, once over the x-axis and again over the y-axis, it would lay on top of itself. Right. So it's called origin symmetry. Here's another one that has origin symmetry. Oh, does it? Does this one? No, this isn't odd. <coughs> so I have opposite x's, a positive 1.8 and a negative 1.8, but my y's are 6.33 and 3.59. They're not opposites. So this is not odd. How about this one? What is this? Even. Yep. Oh. <laughs> Odd, yeah. Neither. Yeah. <laughs> so that's even it. This one, yeah, it does, because it has it has um, a kind of symmetry, but it's shifted over. Yeah, it's shifted over a little bit. So that um, that finishes up even and odd. So maybe I should write down the conclusions here, right? So an even function um, is symmetric about the y-axis, right? And it has this property. <coughs> so we have to think about what this means. It means that when you plug in opposite x values, you get the same y, right? The y value when you plug in x equals the y value when you plug in negative x. That's, yeah. Absolute value is an even function because it has y-axis symmetry and it has this property. When you plug in an x and a negative x, you get the same y. Yeah. And so that's one function that has this property. There are lots of them. And then for odd, it's symmetric about the origin, which means the two kinds of folding. If you fold twice, right, like fold this over the x-axis and then fold it over the y-axis, this piece and this piece will be on top of each other. Right? So it, that's called origin symmetry. And it has the special property that when you plug in, that's not true, this should be f of negative x. f of negative x equals negative f of x. So this says, if you plug in an x and a negative x, you get opposite y values. Plug in a 1.28 and a negative 1.28, right? An x and a negative x, you get a positive and a negative y value. All right, so why are they called even and odd? It is because the most, some of the most basic even and odd functions are, let's use function notation now that we have it, f of x equals x squared, and g of x equals x cubed. Those are sort of the most basic, um, this is called an even function. It has y-axis symmetry. It looks like this. And its exponent is even, right? And g of x, x cubed, it has an odd exponent, and it looks like that. It has the origin symmetry. Any, um, you know, single monomial power function like that that has an even exponent will have even will be an even function. So x to the fourth just looks like this. It's just a little flatter 
but it also has y-axis symmetry. And x to the fifth looks like this. Also has origin symmetry. So it's because odd, odd exponents have origin symmetry. So we call this special kind of function odd. Even exponents have <coughs> y-axis symmetry. So we call this special kind of function even. But I think what you're about to ask me these aren't the only kinds of even and odd function. Uh, oh, okay. Um, um, at the at the bottom it's flatter, um, and then I think I think you're right. I think it like it it'll be. Yeah, you're right. Um, at the bottom it's flatter, but then I think that they cross. I just did it badly. Yeah. Thank you. So, <clears throat> this is why we call them even and odd, but there are lots of other even and odd, other functions that exhibit this property. This is just sort of like the first time we noticed it, so we called them even and odd, and then we were like, oh, there are other functions that have this property too. And we still called it even and odd. <clears throat>